Okay, we'll make a start, everyone. Uh, look, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, paediatric teaching. This is uh, an important uh, teaching session because it's the last week before revision week, which starts next week. For those who are doing postgraduate exams this year, then they'll uh, we start revision week next week, and then uh, and then um, uh, the exams of the following week. Today, I wanted to talk about not not about a particular problem. Um, or a particular disease, but just about common pediatric problems. And I wanted to reflect on the fact that what gets presented to us are not particular diseases or um, uh, uh, formulated conditions, if you like, but mostly they're just problems. And, uh, and as pediatricians, we see lots of problems and they could be problems that are medical or surgical. I mean, pediatricians see a lot of surgical problems in the first instance and at least at the start, I've got a couple of cases that I wanted to discuss where every paediatric surgical problem has a medical problem that could be mistaken for. So we could make mistakes by assuming it's a paediatric medical problem when actually it's a surgical problem that needs a surgical fix. And that when they present, problems are not medical problems or surgical problems, they're just problems, the children's problems, and we need to try to sort it out. And as I said in the, in the summary of this talk, I wanted to discuss things like pattern recognition and deductive reasoning, because that's the deductive reasoning is what we use to make diagnoses, to, to sift through the different, the differential diagnosis and work out which uh, condition it's most likely to be and which condition it's less likely to be. And I'll, I'll try to explain how to use deductive reasoning as we go along. So uh, let's start with a case. This is a boy, a seven-year-old boy who presented with vomiting. He'd been previously well, and he presented with three days of vomiting and abdominal pain. The, his pain was constant in the epigastric region. And initially, it was just clear vomitus. He was vomiting. But then it became brown and bilious, uh, bilious or green, green vomiting. He hadn't opened his bowels for three days. He's had reduced oral intake. And on examination, he had a very distended tender abdomen, had no bowel sounds. He had sunken eyes poor urine output, and several signs of severe dehydration. So this could be mistaken, not mistaken, this could be diagnosed as being gastroenteritis with dehydration, but our job is always to work out what's it most likely to be based on all the clinical information that, that we have available. And I wonder if anyone could um, perhaps suggest what the differential diagnosis of this could be. I guess when we're thinking about a child who has persistent vomiting for three days, uh, abdominal pain, abdominal distinction, then we've got to think broadly. We should think about, well, could it be gastroenteritis? Um, the problem with it being gastroenteritis is that almost always there's diarrhea. It, always when you see a child who's just got vomiting and doesn't have diarrhea, it's very rare that it's just gastroenteritis. It could be a perforated appendix and the child's got vomiting and has got abdominal pain. The, what, that's, that's important to have on your list of differential diagnosis in this, in this situation because one, it's common and two, it requires urgent surgery. Thirdly, it could be a malrotation with volvulus. What's against that? Well, a child being seven years of age, but for it is that the child's got bilious vomiting, abdominal distension, and seems to have signs of a bowel obstruction with just vomiting and no diarrhea. It could be intersusception, again, vomiting, abdominal pain, abdominal distension. It certainly could be that. Um, against it is perhaps the child's age again. Usually intersusception occurs in children who are two or three years of age rather than children who are seven years of age. It could be pig bell, but we don't know the background of the child and we'd want to know a bit more about where they came from, their state of nutrition, uh, whether they ate a, a meat meal within the last seven days, that, those sorts of things. So when we're thinking about a differential diagnosis of a problem that could be a medical problem or it could be a surgical problem, we need to somehow order those differential diagnosis, diagnoses into the most likely to the least likely. And then we need to think about what 
clinical features are there in favour of the diagnosis and what clinical features are against the diagnosis. So that when when we when we uh, try to formulate a differential diagnosis, we are undertaking this process called deductive. We're saying which features are in favour of a perforated appendix and which of them are against. Which features are in favour of malrotation with volvulus and which of them are against. And then you reorder the differential diagnosis based on the the, the conditions that are both the most dangerous and the ones that you really need to identify and sort out and treat immediately and those that are the least likely. This was this boy's chest X-ray, uh, abdominal X-ray, I should say. And uh, can anyone see anything on that? I would hope you can see this, but the key features are that there's distended bowel all throughout the upper abdomen and the mid abdomen. But you can see it's distended gas filled bowel, multiple loops of distended gas filled bowel. And what you can see is there's a, there's no gas filled bowel down in the um, in the distal parts in the rectum. So there's no there's no gas in the rectum. But the dist the distended bowel is all above that, right? You can also see these small lines. See these fine lines um, between the of the small bowel. This is small bowel obstruction, and I'll show you the distinguish distinction between small bowel obstruction and large bowel obstruction as we go along. But this is small bowel obstruction, and the the clinical features of this are the very fine lines. They're called um, uh, conaventis. These are, they're not haustra. Haustra are larger. Um, I'll show you haustra in large in a large bowel obstruction, but this is uh, uh, features of small bowel obstruction. These uh, linear conaventis, which are the small lines in distended small bowel. And you can see how the bowel is, is um, is more central, isn't it? Centrally located and peripheral too, but it's centrally located. If if there's large bowel obstruction, it's usually around the periphery of the abdomen rather than within the center. And you can see all this central distension, or a gas-filled uh, small bowel, and these linear conaventis in the small in the dilated small bowel. This received fluid rehydration and surgery, and he had ischemic or infarcted small bowel in the last. Well, it was 190 centimeters of ileum. So a very large segment of his ileum had infarcted because of a small bowel rotation. A previously well child who presented with vomiting, but which became went from clear to bilious and uh, highly suggestive of a small bowel obstruction. His cecum and large bowel was fine. It wasn't involved in the male rotation. And so he was able to have resection of the the ischemic areas of his small bowel and an ileostomy fashioned, and it still gave him 150 centimeters of small bowel, and he received antibiotics and some nutrition when the surgeons were happy for it to be done. The point of this case is to um, emphasize the point that there is a lot of um, surgical problems that present as 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 they could be any other medical problem. Uh, vomiting is the present vomiting and abdominal pain was the presenting problem. And we need to sort out, is it a is it a medical problem? Is it a surgical problem? What sort of problem is it? And it's only by deductive reasoning that we can do that, sorting out the order of priorities of the different differential diagnosis. I'm, I'm going on to the going to go on to the next case now. This was a similar sort of situation, a 16-year-old boy who had cerebral palsy, but um, and he presented with several days of vomiting, two days of bilious vomiting. He was a boy who had moderate cerebral palsy. He could still walk with a walking frame and with support from his uh, with his brothers and parents. He was non-verbal though, but he communicated in other ways. And this is important because we see a lot of children who have some degree of disability who might develop a a medical or a surgical problem, and it's actually harder to make make common medical and surgical diagnoses because they're not able to tell you quite as much as what otherwise 
an otherwise well 16 year old boy would be able to do. Anyway, he had bilious vomiting for two days. So already you're starting to think this could, bilious vomiting without diarrhea is more likely to be a surgical problem, isn't it? More likely to be evidence of a bowel obstruction. This was his x-ray. And the um, what I wanted to show you here, again, he's got a lot of, uh, the, the dilated loops of bowel are fairly central. They're not very peripheral. And I'm not sure whether you can see it, but I'll just try to move this. You can see again, there's a gasless rectum. He's got most of the, the dilation, dilatations of the bowel are quite proximal, not, not distal. So again, that looks like a small bowel obstruction, not a large bowel obstruction. I talked about these, um, the, the central placement of the dilated loops of small bowel proximal to the obstruction. And I mean, the, the rule says if you've got three more instances of dilatation, more than two and a half centimetres, these were a lot more than two and a half centimetres, then there's a bowel obstruction. The, these, remember I talked about these small linear um, lines that traverse the small bowel called valvular conoventes. They're tiny, small valves within mucosal folds in the small bowel. Um, they, they indicate it's small bowel obstruction. It looks different to Haustra, which I'll uh, explain uh, later in terms of large bowel obstruction, but just know centrally located dilated loops with these valvular or linear conoventes mucosal folds of the small bowel suggest a small bowel obstruction, especially if there's a gasless rectum. If you're looking for a bowel obstruction, you should always take a supine and erect film or, or a lateral decubitus film that will show the air fluid levels in this child it was obvious that there was a small bowel obstruction because the rectum is gasless but it's not always obvious from a supine x-ray so you should always take a supine and a lateral decubitus film and that will show multiple fluid fluid levels this this boy's the 16 year old boy with three days of uh two days of bilious vomiting this was his blood film. And as I've said throughout this year, we need to make the most we can of the tools we've got. And looking at full blood counts is, is a skill that I really want you to acquire because you can tell a lot from a full blood count. We don't need sophisticated tests, but we do need to make the most of the tests that we've got. So this boy's hemoglobin is 15.7. You, If you are aware, you'd say, well, that's a bit high. For a 16 year old boy it could be it could be normal but it could be high and if it's high that would suggest perhaps that he's dehydrated so again you can you you can integrate clinical features and laboratory tests to see whether or not there's support for the clinical features that you think to be there so if i was looking at this i'd say well he's had two days of bilious vomiting he could be dehydrated He's got a high hemoglobin, therefore his hematocrit is going to be high because of dehydration. I wonder if his urea and creatinine are elevated too. And if you looked at that, you'd see that his urea is three times the upper limit of normal and his creatinine is almost two times normal. So probably he's quite dehydrated. And you might say to yourself, well, is does he have a metabolic acidosis? And if you had a if you had provision to, to measure his lactate, you'd see that his lactate was high, again, indicating a metabolic acidosis consistent with him being dehydrated or having severe sepsis. So the point is to make the most of the laboratory tests that we can do, not worry too much about the laboratory tests we can't do. And in this child, you can see that his white cell count was 39,000, of which 25,000 were neutrophils. And again, that should, that should cause you to think, ah, maybe he's got a serious bacterial infection or maybe he's got a bowel obstruction with, with secondary bacterial infection, with uh, inflammation or translocation of bacteria across the bowel wall. You can see that his band count is high. We've talked about this during the year, that if you should look at the white cell count, you should look at the neutrophil count, and then look further down to the band count. And if, he's got, if the patient's got a high band count, that suggests there's a toxic left shift, a left shift of the neutrophils to, to immature forms that may be produced more in the setting of severe sepsis, uh, bacterial infection. He's also got some myelocytes as well. 
and they are even more immature forms, less mature forms of neutrophils. So it suggests that the bone marrow is putting out a lot of immature forms. So when you look at these lab tests, you can say to yourself, well, this supports the idea of a serious bacterial infection, which might be complicating a bowel obstruction. You can also look at the biochemistry, the basic biochemistry, and see, well, his sodium is 149. Again, that's in keeping with him having dehydration. His potassium's up a bit also, and that's in keeping with, probably in keeping with his renal impairment, his acute kidney injury. His bicarbonate is low, again, the manifestation of a metabolic acidosis. And so I hope that you can, you're starting to be able to examine these basic laboratory tests and put it together. Uh, laboratory tests like this tell a story. And what we're trying to do is tell a story, make us make a story coherent so that you can do use deductive reasoning to make diagnoses. This boy was treated with antibiotics, of course, triple antibiotics to cover a bowel obstruction, amoxicillin, gentamicin, metronidazole. And he had surgery just like the last boy. And it was a torsion of a Meckel's diverticulum. So not a malrotation, but he, he had a Meckel's diverticulum, which is in the distal part of the ileum, and that had torted or twisted. And from that, he had a small bowel obstruction and that he needed a small amount of his small bowel excised and re-anastomosed and he uh, recovered well. But it's really only try by trying to identify dangerous conditions that that present as medical problems but uh, have underlying surgical needs this is that's important i i said before for small bowel obstruction you look for those valvular conoventes or the linear conoventes the small fine lines that cross the small bowel and i said that the a small bowel obstruction has dilated loops of bowel in the central part of the abdomen, not in the peripheral part. This is a large bowel obstruction. And you can see there are lines, but they're much thicker lines in between. These are the haustra of large bowel obstruction. I want you to be able to make that distinction between a large bowel obstruction and a small bowel obstruction because it has some implications for what the, the cause may be. So for example, if you saw a, a Hirschsprung's disease, that might be a large bowel obstruction like this, where there's gas almost down to the rectum, unlike in the large bowel obstruction where you'll have gas not down to the rectum. Okay, just that distinction between large and small bowel obstruction. I think as pediatricians, we can make those, we can make that distinction. We don't have to wait for the surgeons to do that. We can make our own, uh, I guess, uh, um, assessment and differential diagnosis. Okay, so that, that was... That was surgical problems that may manifest, may present as medical problems. I've got another problem now that's quite common, I think. This is a two-year-old boy who had fever and tachypnea and then developed arm swelling. I'll explain how common it is in a moment, but of course, fever is common, tachypnea is common, and swelling of an arm is common too. The story was, again, go, you always need to take a history so this boy had had a, a very small burn on his fingers of his right hand two weeks before, a small burn. And he then had been reasonably well. The burn had been dressed at home, uh, washed in cold water, some ice. Um, and then, but he still had, um, uh, the, the skin had been peeling away from where the burn was. And then he got two days of fever and he had very red cheeks and reduced activity. And then he had one, uh, one day of left arm swelling. It wasn't his right arm where the burn was. It was his left arm that became swollen. And he had a painful left hip as well. And he'd, he'd come out in a rash, a blotchy red rash. Again, much of pediatrics is about pattern recognition and deductive reasoning and trying to identify problems that are dangerous and trying to make those diagnoses and rule out other diagnoses or rule out rule out diagnoses that are dangerous and require some input. This actually is a very dangerous diagnosis that this boy had. And I want you to be able to identify this type of thing. From what seems like a very minor burn, he became quite unwell. 
Can can anyone suggest what he might have had? We'll keep going. I'll show you some pictures if you like. This was this boy's rash. You can see the he's got some blotchy red rashes on his skin. It's a bit hard to see, but I'll show you some other pictures of a similar boy in uh, uh, in a moment. Um, blotchy red rashes on his skin. And you can see that his left arm is much more swollen than his right. Um, I hope you can see that. His left arm is swollen and looks a bit more suffused than his right. So his left arm was quite swollen and tense and tender, and he couldn't move it very much. And he had this blotchy erythematous rash on his limbs. And I say this is quite a common problem because I wanted to show you this boy. And this was a 14-year-old boy who two weeks before had been with his friends and they'd done some tattoos. They'd made a tattoo on their arm and that was on his right arm. But two weeks later, his left arm becomes quite swollen and tense and he was unable to move it, unable to supinate his arm. It was, you can see how much more swollen his left arm is from his right. Can anyone suggest what might have happened? The same thing has happened to both these children. The small boy I showed you at the start and this older boy. I think someone's trying to trying to make a diagnosis, but sorry, I can't I can't hear, but I think the the message from this is that even from relatively minor wounds, like a small burn on the fingers or like a tattooing of the arm, you can get a serious infection. And the serious infection is often a staph infection. And this is staphylococcal infection as was the other boy a staphylococcal infection that's involving other parts of the body the staph gets in where the tattoo was or where the minor burn was spreads around the body and lodges in somewhere else like in the skin causing cellulitis or in the bone causing osteomyelitis or in the joints causing septic arthritis or in all of those things or in the muscles causing pyomyositis and that's what both of these children had. There's one other location in which it can lodge, and that can be in the vessels. And, and this boy, this older boy had, and the younger boy had uh, a thrombosis, a staphylococcal thrombophlebitis. And that's why their arms were swollen and tense and, oh. and, and more congested than the other arm because they had a, a venous thrombosis, which was uh related to the staphylococcal infection this was the boys uh the older boys um arm and you can probably see some features some lytic change in the proximal humerus i hope you can see that some lytic changes in the proximal humerus and some periosteal reaction as well it's not the periosteum is not very smooth so this the older boy with the staphylococcal thrombophobitis of the left arm also has osteomyelitis of the left humerus and that all related to the the home tattooing that he did with his friends two weeks before this was his blood film and again you can tell a lot from the blood films that help to confirm your diagnosis so his hemoglobin was 10 that's probably okay his plate count was 132 a bit low his white cell count was 1.6 that's quite low, isn't it? Quite low. And again, when you see this picture, leukopenia with neutropenia, his neutrophil count was quite low, 0.69. His lymphocytes were quite low. His band count was almost as high as his neutrophils. So again, suggesting the, the bone marrow is producing immature forms and causing um, uh, inflammation in the system. When you see neutropenia, and leukopenia and a lot of immature forms, then this is 
severe sepsis until proven otherwise and would be consistent with what you thought when you when you practice deductive reasoning and wondered if he might have staphylococcal infection related to the minor wound that he had on his hand or um, the burn or the tattoo. All right. So this was staphylococcal, severe staphylococcal infection involving the other, the other arm uh, related to the, the relatively minor wound that he'd had before. This was his um, electrolytes. And again, you can see he's got a um, a degree of metabolic acidosis, although his bicarbonate's not very high. His sodium level is quite low. Again, in keeping with staphylococcal infection, you often see that with staphylococcal septic shock um, and his lactate's high, suggesting a metabolic acidosis. So when you put this together, fever, an immaculopapular rash and hyponatremia and neutropenia and a swollen tense arm two weeks after a minor skin burn or a home tattoo, then that is staphylococcal sepsis with septic arthritis and venous thrombosis. And I think you can make those diagnoses with just by a history and examination and those basic laboratory tests. If we practice pattern recognition and deductive reasoning. When looking after such a child, this boy ended up having, both these children ended up having gram positive cocci in blood cultures, and one was a staph aureus and the other was a group A strep. They're still uh, staph and streptococcal infection. The first boy, the small boy was a group A strep, and the second boy, uh, from Port Moresby was a staphylococcal sepsis related to the tattoo. So the questions you need to ask then, it's not just good enough to give antibiotics, but always ask the question, does the arm need some sort of surgical washout? Is there an abscess in there? Is there, um, uh, is there an osteomyelitis that needs a surgical fix? And the second question is, is, it, is the staph aureus sensitive to flucloxacillin? Is it an MSSA, methicillin sensitive staph aureus? Or is it an MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus? In which case, one of these other antibiotics like vancomycin would be, or clindamycin would be the, the treatment of choice. So very important questions to ask because a lot of the staph aureus infections, systemic infections that are acquired in the community are MRSA, at least 25% in some provinces, it's much higher than that. So this child went on and had a, an ultrasound which showed the venous thrombosis and was put on some heparin for that. Uh, didn't need to have a, a surgical washout, but it was MRSA. MRSA causing osteomyelitis and a venous thrombosis. Again, through clinical um, signs and basic laboratory tests and pattern recognition and deductive reasoning, we can work these things out. And the, the last case I wanted to talk about was a, a child who had leg pain and severe respiratory distress. Now, again, a bit like the previous cases, we see leg pain and respiratory distress quite a bit, don't we? It could be rheumatic heart disease, or it could be um, cro juvenile chronic arthritis, or it could be staphylococcal infection with pneumonia, um, there's lots of myositis related to influenza. There's lots of different things it could be. But this boy had had a sort of a more indolent history of, of uh, joint pains. He was two and a half. He was one of twins. He was previously quite apparently well, but he'd had two weeks history of reduced activity and he wouldn't walk. For two weeks, he wouldn't walk. And he had joint swelling of his knees particularly. And when he presented, he was pale and had rapid breathing, but he'd not had fever any time during that, that illness. So again, while it could be staph infection causing staph septic, septic arthritis with a pneumonia, it would be, without fever, we, it makes it less likely. It doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it much less likely. So we've got to think of thing, conditions that might cause this without fever. Rheumatic fever should have fever. It, it's without fever. Influenza causing 
joint aches and pains, usually causes fever. It must be something else, we'll have to think. This was his leg, and he had been on examination. He was quite lethargic, and he was tachypneic and tachycardic. He had severe pallor, and he had eyelid puffiness. He was very uh, looking very edematous, and he had pitting edema of his legs. Both knees were very swollen, like you can see, and he couldn't straighten them. These were in a fixed position like this, with uh, unable to straighten them. On his chest... In his chest, he had moderate respiratory distress, but good air entry. You couldn't hear anything, uh, in, any crackles or anything like that, but he had a degree of hypoxemia. His saturations were only 93%. And he, in his cardiovascular system, he had a very fast heart rate, 180, with a loud pulmonary second sound and a liver that was palpable four centimetres below the right costal margin. So there's lots of things going on here, isn't it? He looks like he's got... Pallor, edema, inability to straighten his legs, tachycardia, maybe some signs of pulmonary hypertension, certainly with his enlarged liver and his loud pulmonary second sound, his tachycardia, his hypoxemia. So something's going on that might make you think, even though he doesn't have fever, there's a number of other things that are happening to him. This was his blood film, and I think... Uh, I. I think you can probably identify that his hemoglobin is low at 5.7. His MCV is quite low. I've, we've talked about how to how to look at blood films during the year. His hemoglobin is low. His MCV is low. His red cell distribution width is quite high. You know, the normal is around about 14 or 15, and it's 20, which suggests that there's different sizes and shapes, a multi multiple different sizes and shapes of red cells within his blood. His white cell count was 6.5, so not much going on there. It didn't seem. His neutrophil count of 4.6 was okay. His lymphocytes are a bit low. Monocytes were normal, and his coagulation was normal. So on his blood film, all we know is that he's got evidence of iron deficiency and not much evidence really of anything else, not much evidence of an infection, not either a very high white cell count or a very low white cell count. So he was transfused 140 mils of packed cells, packed red blood cells, but he had worsening respiratory distress. So perhaps there's something else going on. Certainly he had iron deficiency anemia, but his nutrition was, he, he had a very low weight for height Z scores, weight for length Z score, very low, minus three, but his weight for age was within normal limits. What does that suggest? If you've got a very low weight for length, but a normal weight for age? It might suggest that he's had recent weight loss. His mid-upper arm circumference was 14 centimetres, which for a two-and-a-half-year-old is a bit low, but it's not very low. But when you went into his diet to find out what he what he mostly ate, for, for about a year, he'd mostly had cow's milk. Not much protein, uh, not much in the way of fruits or vegetables. So we know he's got iron deficiency, but why would he have joint pains and why would he have such severe respiratory distress with, it might be pneumonia, or it might be heart failure related to his anemia, but why would he have signs of pulmonary hypertension? That's the question that when you think about patterns and deductive reasoning, you need to try to address. This was his chest x-ray. By now, I hope you can appreciate that his heart looks a bit big, doesn't it? And his heart could be big, and he's got some congestion of his lungs. He's got upper lobe venous diversion, you can see. Um, and his heart size, the cardiothoracic ratio, is greater than 0.5. Uh, the normal is, normal is up to 0.6, maybe 0.55. Remember, in a supine x-ray in a child, you can have a cardiothoracic ratio probably up to 0.55 or 0 0.6, but not higher than that, and this is greater than that. The other thing I wanted you to notice about this is when you see a heart that's big, Think of what part of the heart is big. Well, the left ventricle looks like it's 
extend the left atrium looks like it's extending out a bit doesn't it you can't see the normal shape of the left atrium and also just look at the carina which is the splaying from the trachea the carina divides into left and right main bronchus and i hope you can see that there's a sort of the carina is splayed out instead of being uh, an acute angle it's more more splayed out here you can see the carina is like that which is a bit more um, splayed out than than what it usually is. That will occur when you've got a large right atrium. And this boy had a very large right atrium, again, consistent with the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. So we've got a number of things that might suggest he's got pulmonary hypertension. We've got, he's got a loud pulmonary second sound. He's got tachycardia. He's got a large liver four centimetres below the right costal margin. And he's got this splayed out carina on his chest X-ray. So all, all, all features consistent with pulmonary hypertension, which is probably more than you'd expect for a child who's just got anemia. If it's more, if the splaying of the carina is more than 90 degrees, then that is abnormal, right? You can see, you can draw that on yourself. So he had, after the transfusion, he had severe respiratory distress and he had an echocardiograph that showed suprasystemic pulmonary artery pressures. So he has confirms that he's got severe pulmonary hypertension. And you might wonder why that is. So this is a malnourished child who's got, seems to have acute malnutrition and moderate to severe iron deficiency who also has severe pulmonary hypertension. Remember we said he had knee swelling and, and he had his knees in a fixed flexion position. He couldn't straighten them out. Well, just these are plain x-rays of his knees. And I want you to have a look at the, the bones, particularly the, the metaphysis. Remember there's the diaphysis, the epiphysis and metaphysis here. All right, so look, just look at the, in this area here and see how irregular it is and how um, how uh, it, it looks irregular and it looks uh, uh, sometimes called a, a pencil on end or a hair on end appearance and it looks irregular and and uh, uh, not, not at all smooth like it normally is and there's some periosteal elevation. Now, this was in both knees. If you saw it in one knee, you might think, well, maybe this is osteomyelitis. But if you see it in both knees, if you see it in both knees and the um, and the uh, the child doesn't have a fever, you've got to think something else could be going on. There's a few different conditions that will give you this. Um, you might know them, uh, perhaps. Certainly in newborn babies, you can see this in, in, in syphilis. In older children, you can see it in rickets. But you can also see it in another nutritional condition that sometimes goes along with iron deficiency. And that's, does anyone know what that is? It's scurvy. And it, sometimes you can see it in scurvy. Certainly you see it in rickets and in syphilis. And the last condition you can see it in is leukemia. Often you'll get these sort of bony changes in acute leukemia as well. So if you see a child who's got severe joint pains, then get an X-ray and see if you can interpret that. But think there's always a differential diagnosis. Could it be leukemia? Well, his blood film looked fairly normal. It didn't look like he had a leukemic uh, changes on his blood film. He could have rickets, but usually that would manifest in a slightly different way, not with pulmonary hypertension. He could have untreated syphilis, but there was no other features of, of syphilis in this child or he could have scurvy. And scurvy can be associated, as you know, with gum bleeding, but also with pulmonary hypertension. And so this boy had both iron deficiency and scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. Yeah. So iron deficiency, he also had zinc deficiency and, and thiamine deficiency, but they were manifest uh, in, in other ways. He was treated with just oxygen and with some CPAP for with uh, for 24 hours and treated with vitamin C. He was in severe respiratory distress for 
the first 12 hours. And then he received multivitamins and some thiamine, some frizomide for his heart failure, and just some low-dose adrenaline for 12 hours. And later on, he received iron. So not, not very sophisticated treatment. Oxygen, multivitamins, frizomide for his heart failure. And he improved within 24 hours. But 24 hours later, he had mild to moderate respiratory distress. He was able to come off CPAP, just needing a bit of oxygen. And then 48 hours later, on, his, on a follow-up echo, his pulmonary hypertension had improved a lot. He had good biventricular function, no, no signs of pulmonary hypertension. Why? Because he got treatment for his scurvy and, and he got treatment for his iron deficiency. Uh, there is a pathway for by which um, scur scurvy or vitamin C deficiency can cause pulmonary hypertension. And there's many children that have been described with pulmonary hypertension that's been due to scurvy. I won't go through the pathway, but it relates to the effect of ascorbic acid or vitamin C on the production of nitric oxide, which is a pulmonary vasodilator. And if you don't have vitamin C, then you don't have enough nitric oxide and that can therefore cause pulmonary vasoconstriction. If you don't have nitric oxide, then it can cause pulmonary hypertension. So there is a biochemical pathway by which if in the absence of vitamin C, you'll get pulmonary vasoconstriction and pulmonary hypertension, and it can be reversed by within 48 hours of starting a child on vitamin C. And his skin lesions, uh, his bone lesions got better and his joint pains got better over the coming weeks because of that. But his pulmonary hypertension improved within a short period of time. So I just wanted to go through a few cases today rather than talk about any one particular disease because there's a lot we can learn from individual cases if we take the time to try to understand the complexity of each case. So some of the lessons I learned from these cases, if you see a child who's got profuse vomiting without diarrhea, Never call it gastroenteritis. It's it's usually something else. It could be a bowel obstruction. It could be raised intracranial pressure. It could be some, some other cause, but don't call it gastroenteritis if they don't have diarrhea. You, you should know the signs, both the clinical and the x-ray signs and the causes of a small bowel obstruction in children. Even if we're pediatricians, medical doctors, we should still know those things and know when to refer. If you're going to do an x-ray, don't just do a supine x-ray for a, for a possible bowel obstruction. Do an erect x-ray or a lateral decubitus x-ray so you can see whether there's air fluid levels. If you've got staph aureus in one place, such as on the skin, then look for it elsewhere. Is it in the bones? Is it in the joints? Is it in the lungs or the pericardium or the heart valves? or the meninges, or in the blood vessels, like these children I, I showed you had, it's causing a venous thrombosis. And if staph, if staph infection is not getting better, think to yourself two things. One, have we got adequate source control, or do we need a surgeon to drain an abscess or something? And, and could it be MRSA? Because, as I said, about 25% of community-acquired staph aureus that causes these types of infections will be MRSA. And lastly, in a child who's got undernutrition and iron deficiency or anemia, think could they have some other nutritional deficiency that might be causing their, their clinical features? And this child I showed you had both iron deficiency and vitamin C deficiency, and they were manifest in his anemia, his gum bleeding, limb pain, and his pulmonary hypertension. And they all got better once, both his iron deficiency and his anemia were treated. So I just wanted to go through a few cases that describe how you might recognize patterns in pediatrics and how you um, might then be able to practice deductive reasoning to make diagnoses and provide the right treatment. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop sharing my slides now and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have but as I said in the past, we've talked about individual diseases and I just wanted to try to put it together so that we can start thinking about how to use deductive reasoning and, and pattern recognition to make diagnoses in pediatrics. Thanks.